This is the RDU on Stage podcast. I'm Lauren Van Hammert, your host, and on this episode, I am chatting with the First Lady of North Carolina, Kristen Cooper. This is Lauren Van Hemert, and on this episode, I am joined by the First Lady of North Carolina, Kristen Cooper. Before she became First Lady, Cooper was an attorney, guardian ad litem, and a volunteer at North Raleigh Arts and Creative Theater, Raleigh Little Theater, and the North Carolina Arts Council. As First Lady, Cooper, who is a mom of three, has focused her attention on championing for the well-being of children in North Carolina and advocating for access to the arts. I knew that Governor Cooper and the First Lady were supporters of the arts. What I didn't know, however, was just how rooted their love of the theater was in their relationship and their family life. And that is where my conversation with Kristen Cooper begins. I was doing a little digging, and I read that you and Governor Cooper had one of your first dates at a musical theater performance at a show. So can you tell me about that, and what show was it? Yeah, it was actually our our second date, and uh, we we actually had a first date at the old Daryl's on Hillsborough Street. And then he said, would you like to go to a play with me? You know, he had season tickets at the time, too. Uh, he had them for years. He was a big musical theater lover. And we went to see, it was Annie, okay? But, you know, we still had a good time. But his whole family was there. His mom, his dad, his brother. And I'm like, hey, I didn't realize this was going to be the, the meet the mom. This wasn't going to be the meet the mom experience. But whatever, it, it's still okay. It's been 30 years I was going to say, it seemed, it seemed to work out pretty well for you. <laughs> After you got married, I know you focused on raising the three girls, and two of them have performing arts degrees, so clearly the performing arts was really important in your house, <laughs> raising them. Um, and you were on the board of RLT, so can you talk to me about the role the arts had while they were growing up? Well, but, you know, our kids always love going to the theater and, and um, you know, we, Roy had season tickets when we got married and so we took them as soon as they were old enough to behave, which for them was about three and a half. We started taking them to musical theater and uh, letting them got more tickets and, and started taking the shows and they loved they always, they were always, all three of them were big singers, and they, but uh, I think that we, we, you know, we sort of got, you know, involved in the nitty-gritty. My, I think my oldest, who's now a lawyer, who's a lawyer, the one that did the performing arts degree, but she was doing things at Rocky you know, Playhouse Community Theater and wanted me to do some things with her. And at the time, I think the two younger ones were, I don't know, five and seven, something like that. They were little, and Roy was in the legislature, you know, that's that's nice, but there's no way I can, you know, I can't do like five, six rehearsals a week with kids that age. I just, so I call, actually, when we did the auditions, I, I talked to the director and I said, are there any, are there any kid parts? And uh, she said, you know, you know, it's, it's, it was Camelot. She said, you know, it's like the cast, could, we could expand the cast to have a couple of little you know, page boys or flower girls, uh, you know, and they had heavy dual roles, they did both. And, you know, mm-hmm. bring them in for an audition. So they went and they just loved, they just loved it, the two of them. They just, they were so crazy. When it was over, they were like, oh, mom, what, I mean, aren't you sorry? This is, oh, this is over, this big chunk. And I, you know, and they just, I said, well, you know, frankly, not really, because it was kind of stressful. <laughs> it was kind of stressful. It was like I had, you know, to get three kids, you know, snacks, things for them to do, eating, eating on the run, going and 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 doing this. It was it was a lot of work for me, and of course I was handling my costume changes and their costume changes too, and all that. But uh, I was ready for a break. But yeah, they 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 definitely had the bug then. You have a kid doing a show, you just you know you might as well 
by the time you get home and you know and then have to go back and get them you might as well just volunteer to you know, do whatever people want want doing which was a huge variety of everything from you know cleaning bathrooms painting scenery hanging lights to be in shows with them occasionally if they needed a if they needed a mother figure <laughs> i had served two terms on um board at RLT. I served at North Raleigh Arts and Creative Theater. I did a couple of terms there when we lived up in North Raleigh. And then I did two terms on the North Carolina Arts Council. So I've done a lot of, lot of theater, theater boarding, but I've always liked to be hands-on too. And, and I love that he, the Governor Cooper, was a theater, a theater fan. Usually, you know, it's like me dragging my husband to the theater. Um, we actually did a show. He was actually in one of the shows I was producing once at North Valley Arts and Creative Theater. Uh, we had the whole family. My kids were in a where my kids were in a part. And I was producing, and he, you know, yelled, you know, like as often happens in community theater, we needed a, an adult male role filled, <laughs> and it was a holiday show. So you know, in sits him, and I said it was Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, and he came in and did the dual role of the professor and Father Christmas. He tells people made fun of his accent when he was being Father Christmas, and we say he must have come from the South Pole. <laughs> so earlier this month, Governor Cooper signed into legislation an NC Arts high school graduation requirement, ensuring equitable access to the arts. Talk to me, based on all of your experiences, about the importance of making the arts accessible, especially to, to children. Access is really important because I remember, um, you know, in elementary school, thinking of my, my kids weren't having a, weren't having a terribly positive um, art class experience and thinking, well, this will be the last time that they're required to take art. And they, if, if they're not having a good experience in, in elementary school, they may never, try anything again and um it's it's hard for kids that's something that really was driven home to me with um having kids in community theater that how how privileged that my family was to be able to participate because you know my kids had a mother who could do five or six nights a, a week at, at uh, that community theater and, and make the costumes and, and be there. And we we encountered, there were several kids that they couldn't have participated if I hadn't dropped by their house and, and picked them up. It, you know, it, it's hard if you, if you don't live, um, if you don't live near a theater. And one of the things I think that um, I know that, that RLT has really made a, a real effort to do is to do outreach to those communities and sort of have some satellite, they were, had, were having satellite programs in areas outside of downtown Raleigh to sort of bring kids, in, you know, into that theater experience and have, and have that. And, you know, what I tell people is, you know, it, you learn not just intellectually, but you learn so much about cooperation, about teamwork. Not, not every kid is good at sports. And um, a lot of kids that take part in theater, that is, that is their, that is their team. That is their, they do learn the teamwork. They do, it gives them a place to go. It gives them a place to belong. I had never done theater in, in school. I wish I had, and Miranda and I actually were talking about this the other night, how we both wish that we had done, we had done more like our kids had. Yeah, you do really, you know, the learning, learning lines and, um, you know, having people depending on you. It's a good experience for, for, for most kids, and it's, you know, certainly not, I'm, you know, I don't think that every, every child belongs in theater any more than I think every kid belongs on the football field, but, you know, I think that every child deserves an opportunity to be able to um, observe and decide for themselves if that's, if that's something that they're interested in, because even if you don't end up doing it and making a living off of it, it, it will enrich your life. So you didn't begin performing until you were an adult? It was, with the exception of two skits. I took, you know, like speech class, speech and debate, little things that were involved in that. But no, I'd never been like, you know, I'd never been in my first full-fledged um, theatrical production I did with my, I did with my kids because I couldn't afford a babysitter. <laughs> I love that. So this has been such a crazy year of events um, between 
COVID-19 and then we had the killing of George Floyd, I think truly our community is, and, and really the entire country is in crisis and in limbo right now. So having been involved in the arts, having been involved with Raleigh Little Theater, what role do you think the arts have in bringing the community together? We have been on a 100 county tour and we were at 83 counties, but a lot of those revolved around visiting art councils, which, which a lot of times we were discovering they were kind of the center of the community. In some small counties, you know, they're right downtown and everybody knows where they are and it's where, the, where kids go to go to summer camp or, you know, track out camps. It's, you know, what people do for amusement. It's where the senior, it's sometimes it's where seniors go to have things to fill their day. So quite often that those art campuses, which we have in every single county, are kind of the, the heart and soul of the community. When this struck, we were, you know, sort of all of a sudden we had a lot of time on our hands and everything we were doing was canceled. It was right before our usually have tour season where people are coming to the mansion and, and kids are having history lessons. And we, you know, we wanted to do some things to kind of connect and, and kind of through the arts. And we started out, I, I actually went and listened, you know, sort of fireside chat sort of things. I listened to some of Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats and read some books actually by the fireside and um, I saw that other first ladies in some states were reading were reading books to kids and I thought, you know, we can really we can do better. I think we can do better than that. And my, my chief of staff uh, is Greg Moore, who if you're in the theater community you probably know you probably know Greg and Kevin, Steve's cabaret. So they knew everybody. So let's just see, you know, what we can do and we and we found, you know, a lot of, and I'm not going to name all the people because I know the minute I do that, I'm going to miss people. And, and that would be really bad. But uh, we have some, a lot of really outstanding um, people in theater who, who found themselves at Loose End who just, you know, were very happy to volunteer their time to come on and, you know, read a story, read a poem, sing a song. Um, perform a, a, a musical number. So that was, if you want to see those, go to uh, Kristen, go to, you can go to my Facebook page, Kristen Cooper, First Lady of North Carolina. Um, and some of them, we, and we really made an effort to get a variety of um, different kinds of performance to have, to have a lot of racial and ethnic diversity in the performances that we that we put on, as well as just a, a variety of people from professional actors to, to you know, community theater actors to Broadway performers um, to sports figures, even. And there's an intimacy to those performances because you're seeing people in their homes. If they're not on stage and made up, they're with their children and their husbands and on their couch. And, and there's a real intimacy to those videos. I really enjoy them. Because these have been such unprecedented times, I know um, the governor and I know you, you're really a family of faith. He's a man of faith. He taught Sunday school. Um, he was deacon and elder in the church. So how has faith as a family, as a couple, gotten you both through this challenging time? Sometimes it's stressful and sometimes scary around here. And, um, you know, we've sort of, you know, we've been at kind of the epicenter of some, you know, some kind of scary times here. And the whole world is a, is, is a, is a scary place right now. And I think that all of this, I think there's everybody sort of kind of being into, you know, sort of, more of an individual spirituality that's been taking place around here but we do we all have our our times of peace i'm picking up um meditation again i sort of slacked off for a while so i have a, I have a, a daily meditation time that i try to take to try to to try to chill out and then and and get through that but um you know of course you know we're all we're all praying for the country and for our state and for you know the healing and i know it's it's hard for a lot of people and who who and people like my mother who her church was you know a place 
where she saw her friends and that personal, not having that personal contact is, has been really difficult for her, but it's, you know, it's, it's too dangerous at this time. So, you know, you know, I think we're, we're all looking, we're all looking for guidance and peace and love wherever we can find it. And that's, that's like, I think that's all we can do at this point. A absolutely, 100%. It's all anybody can do. You know, for many months, we were all under the stay-at-home order, and now it's safer at home. Anything that has surprised you or that you've learned about your husband or yourself during, sounds like you've gotten back in touch with your meditation. Any Anything that surprised you about each other during this time? There's not a lot new that I've learned about him since, um, you know, he's, I mean, it's been 30 years, so there's really there's not that many surprises left, let's just be honest. But, um, you know, we're having to, you know, we're having to learn how to do things differently. Right now we're kind of isolated here, and he's been doing most of his work, uh, you know, from his office here at the mansion rather than traveling back and forth. And, Last time I was out of the state, I was I went to see my parents in Oklahoma in February, which I'm glad I did because I don't know when I'll see them again. Um, yeah, I'll see them again. But um, and I don't, I think he traveled the first week in in March. But um, you know we haven't left North Carolina since since that that first week in March, and he's not. I think I've left Raleigh t two or three times. So we're, we're having a, a we're having a lot of time together. So we're sort of you know, lear learning how to ne negotiate that, and, and uh, we're doing having normally in a campaign year we'd be all over we'd be all over the place. That was our original plan. Was I would be on the on the trail at this point probably four four or five nights a week instead of for him, and we just be you know passing. So he's been here, you know, he's here pretty much, well, he's here every night at some point. Now he may be on the phone. And sometimes we're both doing, uh, we're both doing Zoom meetings, you know, in separate rooms of the house. But, you know, I, you know, I've had a lot of time for reflection, I, you know, and I've, um, I was asked by the, by Cultural Resources to keep a journal, which I think may have to be published 10 years after my death, if I want to be honest. <laughs> Is this something other people are going to read now? I may put do like a like a Jackie Kennedy thing, and it's ten years an embargo until ten years after I've died for people to get to read this. But I've I've sort of been re I've been doing a lot of reading and re reading about times of crisis. I you know I read the Eric Larson book about the um, London during the early years of the Blitz and what it was like, and a lot of that I found very relatable to sort of what we're going through right now, the isolation, the having to learn how to do different things, the being, the being cut off, the not, you know, the uncertainty. I, I read the bi biography of Ulysses Grant, and I read uh, The Revolutionary War. I don't know why it's a lot, it's a lot, I read a lot about wars, because it's, um, uh, you know, years and years ago I read, um, this is Barbara Tuchman's book about the, the bubonic plague. I've read that more than once, so there were, you know, some, some parallels in that, and there was the great influenza, about the flu of 1918. But, you know, we, there's, there's there, I, I, as well as loving art, I don't know if they're mutually exclusive, I've always been a, always been an amateur histor history person. So there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to learn from history to get you through, the, you know, times like this, and you realize that there's things that people have dealt with before, and they're, we all have things that we can learn from those past experiences and apply them to our, our own lives. And one that was interesting, one of the things I read in the in the, the book about the Blitz was that there was actually an official agency in um, in England that had that ran diaries. They encouraged people to keep diaries and of everyday life and collected them. So they had specific people who were on this, you know, in this project, and it was quite. That's right. So a lot of the book, you know, had excerpts from these diaries that ordinary people kept to talk to talk about these experiences about it was what it was to get up in the morning and take down the blackout curtains and you know and, and see what kind of damage there had been in the night and what you do. Uh, so uh, you know, I think that I I 
think that would be a great project to, to have during this. So, you know, I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of, I guess, artistic, I don't know how artistic it is. Sometimes it's me talking about what's, what kind of vegetables are growing in the vegetable garden. So not terribly exciting, but certainly sometimes some kind of creative release from, from journaling. Is it, has there been anything that surprised you or that you learned about the people here in North Carolina during this challenging time? And I know this is, I think this is a very cliche statement that, uh, that crisis, uh, in times of crisis, you see, you see the, sometimes the best in people and you, some, and you see the worst as well. And I think that um, different things I've seen that have been, you know, very heartwarming and wonderful, but also some things that have, that have, that have made me sad. Sad to see. Um, I, I do think this may, this may be a, a, one thing that there isn't a parallel in other times is the, the, the rise in social media. And I'm not blaming it for this, but I mean, maybe these things always existed, but you just, you didn't see them as much. So, you know, it's, um, like I said, there some days I, I, some days I need to, I need to just, I need to stay off. I need to stay off the Twitter feed some days <laughs> to maintain my faith in humanity. <laughs> I want to thank our First Lady of North Carolina, Kristen Cooper, for spending time with me and sharing some great stories. I'll put a link to the at-home videos Cooper mentioned in the episode notes. Of course, if you like what you've heard today, please consider subscribing to this podcast, follow us on social media at RDU on Stage, or visit us online at www.rduonstage.com. I'm going to close the show with an original song written and sung by local musician, writer, and artist, Marsha Maddox, entitled All Over. Until next time, I say with watchful optimism, I'll see you at the theater. There's a girl who lives downstairs in the basement of my building. She creeps around and finds food where she can Every time I see her, I put a dollar in her hand But is it enough to say we care? Is it enough to read the news and think we're aware? to be free I wanna be free she wants to be free like all of the people in the world they want to be free when it's all over it's all over Subway drips and we think